let's get straight into it. If you are considering building your own workshop, garden room, man cave, she shed in your garden, and this is the first video you watch, you're in the right place. Albeit this is the end of the series, don't jump straight to that first video building the base now, because this video will tell you some of the things I wish I'd done differently from the get-go. And hopefully it will help you make that decision that you can do this and the best way on which to go about it. That said, the same caveat that I've said at the start of every single video on this build rings true. I'm not an expert. This is not a how-to. All I hope to do is show my journey and give you some inspiration if you're looking at going down the same route. In this video, we're going to answer the biggest questions that I've received throughout the entirety of the build. Tell you the costs, tell you how much I would have saved if I'd have done it differently, which I think is important. And also I'm going to tell you how I wish I'd done it differently, mistakes I've made, and also what I think was done well. So it is worth sticking around through the video because I'm also going to tell you the tools that I wish I'd had. And I'm also at the end, I'm going to tell you some of the ones that I think are the heroes of the build, the tools that I could not have done without. And don't worry, you don't have to add the bits up through the video. I'll get to the end and I'll tell you the exact total of what I spent, the exact total of what I could have spent if I'd have done the savings. And maybe as a bit of an interest point, I'll tell you exactly how much was generated through the videos that has gone towards the build. I came into this utterly naive and I left proud of my achievement. If you're looking at doing what I've done, there's a couple of things that I think you should maybe have in your mind before you get cracking. I didn't make a plan. Well, I drew a picture of what I wanted to build and I submitted that for planning consent, which actually raises an interesting question that I'll come on to in a second. I didn't draw exact plans of how many two befores and how much OSB sheeting I would need. I went in stages to pick up what I needed for the next couple of days. Now that's okay, but if you look at what you're gonna build and you can work out exactly how much materials you're gonna need for the entire build, that's gonna help you because you can go to a timber merchant's or a big box store and you have negotiating power. You can ask for a discount based on bulk and I didn't do that. Assess what you're going to do and how you're gonna do it. Look for those possible areas of failure and make sure that you're clued up to exactly how you're gonna bypass those if it happens. I had a huge one on the fourth or fifth video which could have derailed the entire build. Don't be too proud to ask for help because a lot of what I did should have been done with two, maybe three people, and it would have made it quicker, easier, and safer. And then a silly question, screws or nails? I chose screws for a very, very specific reason, and that is the fact that I'm a complete novice. I needed something that pulled the timbers together and I felt comfortable with, and I know there's shear capacities, etc., that you need to consider, but I spent 357 pounds on screws for this entire build and that bought me 5,100 screws. Think of the cost saving because nails are significantly cheaper. I use them in some areas that I'll talk about as we go along. The next thing to do is look at the space that you're in. Look at the space you want to build in, but also look at how you get everything to that space. Now, this is gonna sound silly because a lot of people will have rear access to their gardens. You're the lucky ones because you can choose to actually buy one of these garden rooms already made, prefabbed. I'll give you some costs of how that compares with what I spent as we get towards the end, but I didn't have that choice. This was my biggest weakness on this build, bar myself and my lack of skills. That is the fact that I live in a very old terraced house, and I mentioned planning permission earlier, the fact that it is so old means it's listed, which is why I had to apply for planning permission. But it went further than that, the fact that I have no access to the rear garden meant that certain choices were made for me. So. In putting in planning permission, I had two months to kill. And this is where I made my first really big error. I looked at the space I was working in and I had to build over where my old shed was. Now under my old shed was a patio and I assumed that was flat. So I thought I could cheekily do a little bit of work while waiting for planning permission and I built the entire patio next to it to build on. Now why did I choose a patio? Well, this is what we're talking about with access. I didn't feel like I could get a base poured the size I wanted it into the bottom garden with no rear access. I didn't ask anybody though. And I could have made a huge saving and had a more stable platform to work on. But with bad luck comes good luck. And my biggest bit of good luck is that I have a timber merchants around the corner. It's not the sort that's gonna sell you a live edge slab, but it's gonna sell a lot of trade materials like two befores and OSB sheets. So I went there while waiting for planning permission. I was met with friendly, helpful, useful advice from lovely people. 
But the flexibility they offered me helped me get around the fact that I have no front drive to store any materials on. I actually did a video of the sheet goods and the timber going through the house. This is to show you where everything went through. And while I'm showing you that, the other thing they supplied me with is one, prices that matched my big box store, two, flexible deliveries. So at the end of the day, I ran out of something, they could get at me the next morning. They also could do multiple deliveries for certain amounts of stock so that I didn't feel the pressure to carry it all through in one go and leave myself too tired to actually build the workshop that day. Absolutely priceless. Actually, let's talk carrying for one second because there's two ways you can do what I did of carrying all of these materials through the house. The first one is to make yourself a makeshift panel carrier. And I love this because it means you can have a straight arm, you can put your plywood sheeting on there, and you can carry it with a straight arm supporting it at the top with this hand. And that is more comfortable than some of the ones you can buy online. I converted mine to make it a bit wider so I could actually put a slab on it and carry them down individually. Onto the videos. We're gonna rattle through these. From here on out, if you watch the videos, you will get a lot more detail than what I'm giving you right now. So the base comes first. And we've talked a little bit about the patio. I have to say, that was a lot of work removing three tons of soil, carrying down three tons of sand, three tons of rubble, and 43 paving slabs to make up that patio. I thought that was the easiest way, but actually consider if you're doing this, that, that even if you can't get access to get a pad poured, you might be able to mix your own using one of those mini cement mixers. I also wish I'd just torn down the old shed and ripped up the other patio, because when I finally got to that patio, after getting planning permission and ripped the shed down, it wasn't level. That gave me some headaches that I had to get past and it would have been a lot easier just to have a clean slate. So the total to get from mud to the top of the slabs, 1,200 pounds. Now, I've done a tiny amount of research. You could get a pad laid for you this size if you've got the access and you can make it happen for about 700 pound. So there's a saving straight away there. Top of that patio is where we built the wooden frame and this actually was my first introduction to framing. And the costs on this are just the cost of the timber, which I think I got at a very average price. So it's just two befores, OSB sheets, and all the insulation you see me put in it was from the old shed. So that cost me nothing. I want to say at this stage that the timber merchants that I went to have asked for nothing in return, and I asked for nothing from them. There's no sponsorship, no special deals. Now the frame, with all of the two befores, the OSB, the rubber pads underneath it, the damp proof membrane, total cost of 710 pounds. I think the only saving there is if timber prices come down. I learned an important lesson at this stage. If you're building in the summer, look after your health other than just PPE. Put on a hat, wear sunglasses if anything's foil lined and cover it up to stop the sun beating down on it and roasting you. The one criticism I got, which is fair, is the rubber pads. Do they raise the building off the ground enough to stop any rot and to create an airflow underneath. The biggest reason I did it is because I couldn't afford to raise the building off a decent height because I'd lose overall height and therefore ceiling height inside. I think I made the right choice, but only time will tell. Video two, framing the walls. All of this entire video is just two befores and screws. However, there was one big error that I made that will have a massive effect down the line. And it's still causing me a headache. But let's leave that for a second. The total cost of it, thousand pounds on the nose. What I could have saved, well, you could space your two befores out significantly more than I did. I went belt and braces because I was a complete novice at this. I reckon you could save 200 pounds just in the materials. As an aside, if you've got rake walls and you want a nice simple technique for it, check out that video because to be honest, drawing everything out on the base is probably the smartest thing I've ever seen. And it wasn't my idea, Ali Dumuk. Look at his website, he does everything in detail, way more than I do. Video three was about sheeting the walls and putting up the rafters. Now let's do the rafters first. I thought I could get away with two by fours. I was wrong. Rafters are two by sevens. If you are planning a roof with no support in the middle, you have to check out a span table. You have to check out how much of its own weight it can take without being dangerously overweight and potentially bowing in the middle. Because of my distance, I had to go with two by sevens. One of the minor mistakes I made here was that I said that OSB sheets need a gap between them for wood movement. I heard that somewhere. I don't think it's entirely true and it does create a bit of a faff everywhere you're going to put spacers in them. And also, if you see how I put the rafters on with these angled steel brackets, I put them on every single side. 
uh, instead of just on one side of each of the rafters. I reckon I could have saved not only 50 brackets, but I could have saved 400 nails. And when you're putting them in with a hammer, that's a lot of arm work you're saving. The total cost of this section, a thousand pounds again. Now there are ways you can save quite a lot on this. It's not just the taking out of the brackets. You could lose a bit of the timber because again, I've spaced mine very close together. Also, and again, no expert, but I've seen a lot of people build these where they haven't put the OSB on the outside. They've just gone straight from the two befores to the breathable membrane to their cladding and that's enough structure for them. So the saving here is quite big. You could save yourself £387 in total if you went for a complete budget route. Now video four, this is one of my favourites. This is the roof. This was a test. But there's other features within this video, not just the rubber roof. So we'll come back to that towards the end. The first stage of the roof is to sheet it with OSB. And that went surprisingly well. And the breathable membrane around the outside, which gives me supreme confidence that I've made this as watertight and as damp proof as possible. That was easy. Staple gun, it's just a routine. Tape it, no problem at all. And then equally with the soffits and the fascia, so long as you do everything in the right order, that is just a really easy job and it's very simple to get it neat. But the biggest area of interest on that video was the fact that I did the roof in extreme heat. Well, extreme UK heat. All the glue goes off quicker, everything gets harder, and I managed to get the entire roof down in 28 minutes. Not because I'm good at it, but because I had to. Rollers broke, I glued my knee to the roof, and I ended up smearing a lot of the glue around just by my hand, which not all of it got caught on the video. What I would say is if you're doing this, firstly, it's a two person job and it's not just for the help, it's the safety. If I'd have fallen off that roof at any stage, there was nobody to know I'd actually done it. And that was silly. As for the actual roof and the rubber, I don't question my decision on that at all. It's one of the most expensive ways to go, but it's good quality and there's no affiliation with rubber for roofs here. The product is great. The video guidance is amazing. Every part of that process felt like I'd done it before because the research I'd done prior to laying that roof. Me, that's where the problem came from, deciding to do it on a hot day. Now, you can go a cheaper route. I want to say, on the record, I would not, this is the one area I wouldn't save on. What I would do is buy two of every tool I'm going to use to put the rubber roof down. Because if one breaks, you've got one up on the roof next to you that you can pick up and carry on. Total cost before savings was £1,370. Now here's the savings. You could lose the soffits and the fascias. If you want to replace the roof itself, well, corrugated bitumen, corrugated plastic, corrugated metal, asphalt, any of them will do the job. You could save technically £570 off your budget. Next up was the windows and the doors. When framing the very first stage of the walls, I can tell you this is where it led to a significant problem for me with the doors. I wanted to get doors that were pre-made. When I was framing, I put in a chunky two by six lintel, thinking it needed to support the weight across the double span of the doors. I've since realized that that is massive overkill. And when you're limited for height, if I'd have just used two befores, which would have done a suitable job, I would have saved myself inches. And those inches are important because they would have meant I could have bought a door ready-made without spending a fortune on it. I decided to not have windows that open because, well, you'll see in a second, but I'm not using them as windows. They're there for the aesthetics and for the sale on value to someone else. And I went online and I ordered panes to a specific size I want. And within a couple of weeks, I had them. They are a positive. They're easy to fit and fairly inexpensive. The total cost of the doors and the windows was £900. Admittedly, making the doors myself and making the windows myself is where I'd already made the bigger saving. But I could have made a bigger saving. And here's the thing. This entire wall is now my entire French cleat wall and it's storage. This is the backdrop for filming and I didn't really want to put too much storage on it. That's the doors. So this side being the windows would have been a lovely place to have more storage. When you're filming anything, you need to have a consistent light. So I've blocked them with soundproof panels to add to the soundproofing, but also to stop any light fluctuations. What I should have done was take out the two windows closest to me and had a whole nother storage wall. So taking out two windows would have saved me 200 pounds. There's your saving. Because then we're on to stage six and that is the cladding. I got tunnelized timber for, for the entirety of the outside. The entirety of the cladding section cost me 1,221 pounds. Your saving is if you don't use tunnelized wood, you don't use timber, 
and you replace it with something like Badger's Workshop's done, which looks lovely, which is corrugated vitamin, you could save yourself £600 just on the cladding. So that's a workshop built. I needed to go one step further. I needed to get the interior done and I needed to go heavy on the insulation. And it's not just for those temperature changes, but I live in a village where people are fairly close to my garden and I need to try and control the noise, not only coming in, but also going out. But I made one big error. I don't regret how I've insulated the roof and I've done it in a kind of hybrid style. I've taken it from other people's ideas, but I drilled holes in to vent fresh air into the gap I'd left. Don't do that, it doesn't need it. All you're doing is putting cold air into an area where you should have warm air that should keep the room warm. There was another big lesson. If you watch that video, clear the space. Clear it all before you start doing anything, insulation or putting up plywood sheets on the wall or the ceiling. Because if you've got all of your things in here, it's an absolute nightmare and it will double the time it takes you to do it and double the effort it takes to do it. Total cost of the insulation and the entire interior with all the plywood boards on the wall and everything came in at 2,000 pounds. If you take away the specifics that I put in, like the acoustic tape, the thicker rock wool and replace that with polystyrene boards, go down a cheaper option on your insulation, you can easily slice off 500 pounds from everything that I did. I spent 1,500 pounds getting this wired and that included the armored cable up to the house, the fuse box I've got in here, the kill switch for all the electrics, spotlights in the ceiling and I forget how many double sockets, it's about 15 to 20 double sockets across the entire place, including up on the ceiling. Now, before we wrap this up with the summaries, the totals, the costs, everything, let's just talk the heroes of the build. I've raved about these gloves. You're carrying a lot of things up and down. The grip that these give you make you feel twice as strong when you're gripping a bag of sand. Don't use them with your power tools. I don't recommend that with gloves for the lugging, the lifting, the carrying, amazing. If you're gonna go down the route of screws, get yourself an impact driver. They are amazing. If you're gonna get an impact driver, get yourself earplugs because they are loud and it only gets louder or it feels like it only gets louder the more you use it. I didn't think I'd use my router and my reciprocating saw, but reciprocating saw is great for rough work. When I was cutting out the windows, phenomenal. The router for cleaning up the edges of the windows, the edges of the roof. I didn't realize I was gonna use it with a flush trim bit for this project, but it was a surprise and a delight. Circular saw and speed square go without saying for cutting down two befores. There are some tools that I should have got. Knee pads. From the start of this job to the end, my knees have been screaming at me to get knee pads. Get yourself a platform, keep yourself nice and stable, nice and sturdy and safe. Let's quickly total this up. Total before electrics, 9,300 pounds. Add on the electrics, 10,800 pounds. Add on the screws, 11,177. And that is the total build from mud to roof to interior. 11,177 pounds. If you do the savings and you go down a more budget friendly route, 8,322 pounds. Now, if you're making your comparisons, this is 4.8 meters by 3.6 meters by 2.5 meters. I did do a quick research online to see how much it would cost me to pay someone to do this job for me. If you went down the bespoke route, which is the route that I would have had to go down, then for the same size and similar spec, 22,000 pounds, up to 47,000 pounds if you add in a few fancy bits. If you buy it prefab, and have it delivered and put together on site, 22,000 pounds to 28,000 pounds. So all in all, half the cost and a lot of work, but a lot of satisfying work, but also eight videos. And eight videos is not a small amount of videos to make. Eight videos have generated up to date 259,000 views. They've gained me just shy of 2000 subscribers. And they've created an income of £1,100 through ad revenue. But that doesn't really tell the whole story because 2,000 new people subscribing to do what you guys are doing and watch videos on my site has a knock-on effect through other videos. I feel incredibly satisfied, but I also feel so happy that the community has spurred me on through this build. If you're still here and you've watched and this is still your first video and you're deciding should you do this, I didn't go into this with a huge amount of skills in large construction. I didn't go into it with any planning. 
So all I can say is, if you are like me, you should do it. If you are more skilled than me, you should absolutely give it a shot. But learn from my mistakes and hopefully be inspired by what you see and what you're gonna see on future videos. I really hope this video has helped. If you've enjoyed it, please click the like and subscribe. And a new thing I'm gonna ask you to do, if you like blogs, if you like tool recommendations, there's also a link to my website down there, which is starting to get more and more content on it. Take a look. But most of all, if you've enjoyed this video and you wanna start building, here's a link to the first one. If you're still not sure yet, here's a link to the speed run of the entire build. I hope you give it a shot. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you over there. Thanks for watching.